I'd almost compare it to like Lord of the Rings when Frodo throws the ring in the fire and it's like, it's done. It's done. And then it's like the darker bit after where it's like, wait, what the hell's next? Hello, and welcome to the first My Defining Moments of 2021. And for me, it's a first male guest on the show. He was one half of the duo that won Great Britain's first Olympic gold medal in diving. Chris Mears has won multiple medals at World, European and Commonwealth level. But it almost didn't happen, as a ruptured spleen during a competition as a teenager left him fighting for his life. Also a talented music producer, Chris opens up about his mental health struggles following that Olympic gold and how the recent lockdown has helped him both personally and professionally, as his music career is really beginning to take off. So, let's dive straight in and see what five defining moments Chris Mears has chosen for us today. Hi Chris, welcome to the podcast, welcome to being on My Defining Moments, thanks for being a guest. Thanks very much, thanks for having me. Um, So yeah, obviously this last year has been a bit of a crazy one for everyone, but I guess for you focusing on on your music now it's actually been pretty productive yeah it has um you know i appreciate like it's it's been a tough time for everyone and a time where you know you just have no idea what's around the corner and no one knows when it's going to end or when it's going to get better so it's it's one of them things of trying to stay positive and the one thing i have been able to do is completely sink my teeth into doing music every single day um and that's what I've been doing, <laughs> and that's what I love. So uh, it's it's been pretty pretty good, pretty blessed for me, and uh, just been working a lot of different avenues and actually doing kind of stuff on the business side and A and R side, like trying to find songs for other people. That all of these things that I never thought I'd be doing, you know, but it's really good to be a part of. And obviously you've had the time to dedicate to that and especially since you've retired from diving it's been I guess full steam ahead with your music? Yeah I think there was definitely a period of time where I was trying to find who I was again and I was going from being you know Olympic gold medalist to kind of starting at the bottom and starting in a completely new industry that I'd worked in before I'd done bits and pieces but you know when I think back I was like, I was quite naive to think that it was just going to be easy. Um, but luckily, I kind of have the, I guess, the the drive and the work ethic from being an athlete to to work at it and pursue it and make sure it happens, basically. Okay. Um, well, let's just get straight into your, your first defining moment, which was kind of, well, at the very start of your life. Um, you've mentioned losing your, your mother to, to breast cancer when you were young. I mean, obviously, that's a huge impact for anyone. Um, but I guess being that young, how, how did it affect you and how did it affect your development growing up? Yeah, I think that for me, I put as the number one defining moment. I think it's the first thing when I think about myself that I kind of, you know, it's a really big part of my life. Losing a parent, especially at a young age, um, it almost, is, I guess it's going to sound strange, but in a really positive way, it gave me so much kind of positivity as to thinking like, whatever I do, um, she's going to watch over me and she's going to protect me. And that is one of the biggest powers and strengths that I have and hold against myself. Um, I didn't get to know her. I didn't have an opportunity to remember anything about her really other than some photographs so for me yeah in my darkest times and believe me there have been some dark times in my life and that that's really helped me through all of them and obviously going into like into sport I suppose that has been some sort of driving factor as well knowing that like you said she's looking over you and you've got something to kind of something else that is spurring you on I guess to achieve greatness yeah in my most uh difficult moments even you know like when I was stood for my final dive um in Rio Olympic Games I had it's actually an amazing moment we'll obviously come back to this later but I had a moment where I could almost feel 
her presence like above me and then I have my stepmom who's raised me amazingly and my dad uh to the side of me in the crowd and it just felt like an all-encompassing like yeah I've got this you know this it wasn't even like a question of if I could do it it was like I've got everyone around me like supporting me which yeah it's lovely to have that yeah nice nice to have that reassuring <laughs> it's like spirit angel over you um just in terms of, of sport how how did you get into sport how did diving enter your life it happened quite organically in the way that I was just a mental kid, like super annoying, like pestering everyone, running about, trying to do somersaults everywhere. And I think I was just basically, I was super irritating. And I think my parents were like, we need to get him into sport, like so that he can come home from it and not be annoying. (laughs) And uh, yeah, I found, I guess my parents put me into swimming. I started doing that. I was grateful to dive off the block and then didn't really make it to the other end. And I always looked over at the diving pool because I started in Reading Central, shout out Reading Central, which is no longer there, but was basically this the breathing ground for the start of my love for diving. I saw it and I saw people wiping out and hurting themselves and I was like, I want to go at that. <laughs> that. That's what attracted you to it, was it? All the all the big spectacular fails? Pretty much, yeah. I I just remember seeing it and being like, what is going on there? Like, I've, I've got to have a go at that. It looks fun. It looks dangerous. <laughs> And then at what stage did you kind of realise that you were actually pretty good at it and I guess started to enter competitions and I suppose there must have been coaches who were kind of singling you out as a as a potential? Yeah. Um, to be honest, I don't know. I don't. It, it all seemed to snowball out of control. Like, I remember I did a few lessons and then in two months, Reading Central, like, you're the best, like, talent we've ever had, you know, which was kind of a council programme. Um, they weren't necessarily trying to scout talent. They were just trying to put something on for people that were interested in partaking in the sport, basically. So um, they kind of took it to a higher level, and I went I went on this program called World Class Start. Um, and then a woman called Chelsea, uh, she singled me out, and she said, this guy's got to jump like a kangaroo. Um and we need to keep an eye on him. And then I went through all the kind of grassroots uh, world-class start program. And from there, like, I started going to Southampton one day a week at the age of, like, 10. And then 11, it was two days a week. 12, it was three days a week. And then at, like, 13, 14, I made a full transition to diving for Southampton Diving Academy full-time. And I guess, like, British team were then calling you and inviting you to go to junior events. That must have been pretty exciting when you were at school and trying to be a normal kid but then you're also jetting off around the world to compete was that was that pretty exciting I think again maybe it was something about my personality or I don't know I just didn't think about it it was just like yeah I'm this is what I'm doing like, it wasn't there was no thought in it and um that's where you know one of the other defining moments comes in when I kind of take start taking it more seriously but I, I guess my mindset and my approach to a lot of things I did like my school like when I was young I was like I don't care don't care like as long as I'm having fun and I'm doing this and I'm doing that I was kind of not drifting but I was kind of just going along with it like yeah parents are taking me to training like I enjoy it when I get there some days are really hard and some days I don't enjoy it some days I do and it was all just a bit like yeah this is just happening you know well yeah you mentioned there leading up to your your second defining moment um January 2009 you're you're 15, you get invited to go to the uh, Youth Olympic Festival in Sydney, Australia. Obviously, massively exciting. But, um, yeah, didn't quite make it back, did you? <laughs> yeah, not for a while, no. Um, men- mental. I still... I forget about it. And then I think back to it, and I'm like, I'm so lucky like to still be here. So, yeah, just, just to explain in detail, kind of what happened and what was going on inside your body that you didn't know about and then that led to you kind of rupturing your spleen and and, well nearly dying yeah I had glandular fever which is something that's extremely common it's also known kind of to the Americans as like mono some people in the UK might know it as mono um yeah it's pretty it's pretty gnarly um a lot of people that get it can get it for a period of like 18 months some people get it and have no symptoms Generally, you feel fatigued, tired, glands up, ill, like just a bit rough. I maybe had my glands up a bit, but not enough to notice anything was just cracking on. 
it was a day of my competition actually and I didn't know at this point but overnight there was a small rupture in my spleen and that had been kind of bleeding overnight I was felt maybe a little bit lightheaded but I was like haven't eaten ate my food got to the I didn't even get to the port actually I left the food hall and uh, it was like a mock-up Olympic game, so you've got like loads of options for food. So it's super exciting. So I'm there eating my competition breakfast. Like, yeah, this is going to be great. I walked back to go back and get my bags and stuff and go, and I, I just fell straight into this car, um, this white Cadillac. I think I like knocked the wing mirror off it or some something crazy like that because I was just it was like bright lights, overexposure, and then next thing I knew. I was like in and out of consciousness, seizures and all sorts. And there were these people over me like, we've got to get into the hospital now. And I was like, oh, Jesus. I just remember this moment of of like, if I don't get, if I don't feel better in the next like five, ten seconds, there's like, there's something serious going on. And that didn't stop. <laughs> they just carried on. Um, and then I was in the hospital and then I was, yeah, I won't go into too much detail with that because it was so horrible. But I remember waking up and uh, my dad was there. And that's, I just kind of went, hey. And then I went back to sleep. I was in ICU. And then after that, I got out of ICU and my blood levels were like ridiculous. They were all over the place. Like my platelet count was two. I think it was the lowest ever recorded on a surviving human in that hospital, um, which is mental. And... uh yeah, I went back and my blood then went to like 400 platelets instead of like 300. I think it was even higher. But yeah, basically it was just mad. So they were like, we need to thin your blood out and just make sure, like slow down, like make sure everything's all good. And then it was Australia Day, like a month after, and I was like, I don't want to go anywhere. I just want to stay here. I stayed in, everyone else went out, and then probably 30 minutes later they came back and I was having a seizure and that carried on for eight hours and they put me into a coma and then told my parents he's probably not going to be the same when he wakes up and I seem to be all right so it's all good but yeah it was a bad time yeah so you well they said you had what a five percent chance of survival at, on arrival in the hospital yeah yeah it was it was it was five percent that they they plucked out of the air god knows how they work it out but they 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 you know when my dad's picking up the phone and yeah, it's five percent. You know, drive. Out. It was almost like drive over to, oh, not drive over. Obviously, Australia. It was <laughs> fly over to uh, be here. I guess, uh, which is pretty brutal. Um, but yeah, some miracle happened. Yeah, and obviously, well, you were probably told. I'm assuming that you were told that you were not, you'd never dive again and all that kind of stuff. And was it was it pretty dark when you were kind of recovering, thinking, what I'm actually going to do with my life if I don't do diving? Or were you not were you not that worried? Or were you just glad to be? be alive um this is where i would tie in what i said before with the kind of the drifting and the trying to be a class clown and trying to be cool and stuff and probably having a bit of a chip on my shoulder about my mum and all of these things i wouldn't say they were dealt with because of it but i would say that i found my purpose and i was like okay i'm not that academic like as much as maybe my dad wants me to be I'm not that academic I'm really good at diving and I should just do that and give it literally everything I've got and surely something will happen um so I you know I came off the back of that and that was the mindset and there was that I was unshakable like no one could tell me different anyone telling me different it was actually more power to me like doctors saying this is really dangerous like you shouldn't be diving or at least if you are you should be only diving at like a 60 50 60 percent capacity I was like I'm going 100 and that's it and that's in my control so it was almost good for me the more that people said like don't was me going I'll prove you wrong I mean exactly because diving's not a low impact spot is it you know you're hitting water at great speeds and it, it can't be it can't be easy on your body so that there must have been a lot of worry around your physical health yeah and I think the big worry with a lot of the doctors was the fact that I'd had the seizures and they then took that as is he prone to getting seizures now if he is spinning around is probably not a great idea which I understand why they got to that conclusion but for me, it was very much a like, I had the seizures because my body was under so much stress 
that that was the only I guess it was like a reset you know when you reset a Windows computer or whatever like ding 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 it's a bit of that you know and it's like my body's going whoa chill out I'm gonna reset and I don't think it was just a thing of like oh Chris now gets you know seizures so I ignored it and carried on <laughs> yeah well literally carried straight back into it almost and within 18 months of that of that seizure and being in a coma and everything you were fourth at the Commonwealth Games in Delhi I mean <laughs> that's quite the comeback yeah that was that was that was cool um there was a big backlash in terms of my physical health um because of the splenectomy a spleen just in layman's terms like filters your blood um and protects you from viruses or from whatever i don't have that and at that point my body was not happy like every week or every month at least i would be getting a temperature of like 40 degrees like shaking in bed uh brutal anyone you know most people will have had a similar experience when they just get a bit ill and it, it sucks you know I was getting that like every couple of weeks or every month at least and I just had to push through that and I think off the back of the plane journey probably a bit of the not so nice air um I got ill for like five days right so I was in bed and I'd lost all of the muscle that I'd built up for the competition was pretty much gone because <laughs> I didn't eat and I was being forced to drink and it was just coming back up and all that stuff. I won't go into too much detail for that. But yeah. Um, and then the day before the competition at 2 p.m., my coach was like, if you want to compete, you need to get in today. Otherwise, I'm pulling you from the event. I'd already pulled out of the other event I was entered in. And this was for the Synchro event with a great friend of mine, Nick Robinson Baker. Um, so I'm like, I'm, I'm doing it. There's no way I'm not going to come to Delhi and compete in the Commonwealth Games. It's like one of my dreams. So... I got up, forced myself, and I literally felt like outer body. Like for diving, you need so much balance. You need strength, finesse, and all of these other little pockets of stuff that makes a good diver. And I felt like I was stripped of everything. And my head was like I had, I just felt awful. Like there's no two ways to put it. And I lied, basically. I was like, yeah, I feel really good. Like I'm going to take it easy today and then see how tomorrow is. But I'm definitely doing it. And uh, everyone raised their concerns about it and was like, this is a terrible idea. But I went with it and I almost hit the board because I, I did an inward. No, it wasn't inward. It was re my reverse twister. It was my least favorite dive. I needed a good takeoff and I didn't get a good takeoff. And I very nearly hit the board from the side view. It looked like I was going to hit it, but I was sideways. So I missed the board. If it wasn't for that, we would have got a medal, um, which I always look back at that and I'm like, valiant effort but it was probably a, a bit of stupidity like I shouldn't have competed and my coach throughout the whole thing like she was she was advising me giving me coaching comments but I could tell that she was like I want to pull you out because this is dangerous <laughs> so yeah London 2012 was kind of the next big competition and obviously it was a huge moment for the country um the diving team like Tom Daly was one of the poster boys and it kind of brought an extra lot of attention on, on the team as a whole um, how was that whole crazy summer of 2012 from your point of view? Um, yeah, it was mental. It was, it was all my wildest dreams, like packed into one event. Um, I'd never done an Olympics and just being an athlete, like regardless of outcome, like just being in amongst all of these other really talented athletes and people that are famous and stuff like you're just walking around and you just it's too much man it's too much for someone that is a sports fan especially like to be part of like and that was me i would say that olympics was me as a boy you know not a man i was there as a young a young lad just mesmerized and blown away and then on top of that competing as well as i did was was such a bonus like I don't think it really came from a place of thinking about it too much. Um, it just came from passion and like enjoying it. Like I'm almost embarrassed when I watch back because it's like I was there with a grin on my face and I was just soaking it up. Like the crowd was 
mental. Like it was so loud. Any athlete will tell you, like in any event, will just tell you how loud like we supported our athletes as a nation, and that that resonated. Well, actually, resonate through the board. One time, it was so loud <laughs> that it it resonated in the board, the the noise, and I could feel like the crowd in my feet, which is so weird, <laughs> the mental. But I was gonna say that you know that resonated through all the other events, and you know like, and it came out in my performance. Like, I felt almost like charged up. Um, but yeah, like getting ninth. I think it was ninth. I got individually. And then, which is mental, that's ridiculous. I was competing against Alexander Despartis, which is like one of my favourite divers ever. I was competing against He Chong, like, what the hell? Like, it was mental. I didn't expect to make that final. So that was lit, that was incredible. And then the synchro with Nick, we put up a decent score. Like, we, we dived a game with smiles on our faces and soaked up the energy of the crowd and it was just felt like a really slow event like it just felt like you know we had loads of time in between to kind of chat with each other and we had a good relationship at the time we were good mates so it was just like it was so easy and it seemed too easy um really it was like very comfortable and it was just a lovely lovely experience and then I guess off the back of that, you must have kind of, well, obviously Tom Daly won a bronze medal, which would have secured funding for the whole team, which is pretty important. Yeah. And I guess looking ahead, you must have thought that was my first Olympics, kind of done that, enjoyed it. The next one's going to be the focus. And I guess the next four years was kind of leading up to that. And you were then, well, didn't dive with Nick anymore. Your synchro partner was, you were paired up with Jack, Jack Law. Um, was, that an, was that a natural progression, do you think? Or was it something that was going to thrust upon you? There was definitely not thrusted upon me. Um, as I said, I had a great relationship with Nick and still do now. He's a great guy, good friend. Um, but I think in a lot of people's careers, they are, I guess when you're constantly looking for more, it got to a point where Nick was kind of reaching the end of his career and for him to do another Olympics would have been quite a push. And also in terms of my ability... I felt I was outgrowing what he could do because times change so quick in sport, right? So, you know, our list was a certain degree of difficulty and I was pushing myself to do much harder degree of difficulty dives. Whereas Nick had his list that he was extremely capable of and was extremely consistent with. So moving to dive with Jack who for me is the most talented diver hands down in any country in that event was an honor really like he was really young and I kind of taught him the ropes of competing in synchro because he'd never done that before and it was a new and exciting uh journey I guess and we didn't know that we were going to end up being best friends that just was a byproduct of us living together and training together every day and learning new stuff together like you know we we just became best best friends yeah and I think do you feel like that was reflected in in your partnership on the you know in the pool as well obviously you were you know having great success early on and uh, um, obviously you moved to Leeds as well to live and train with him it was you know real commitment that you thought that this could be the next the next big step for you yeah I kind of said earlier, like, it's not part of my nature is to do things by halves. And the hardest decision in, almost the hardest decision in my career, one of, was leaving my coach at the time, Lindsay Fraser, who was amazing. And she she made my career. She she took me from Reading and got me to Southampton. And, yeah, she nurtured me from a quite a young age. To leave her and to, and to go under AD's wing and he was head coach of Leeds at the time, that was such a big deal. Like, you know, but it was something that I, I was like, I need I need to do this for my career. And if I want to train Synchro of Jack, I'm not going to do this thing where I'm in Southampton and then there's this disconnect. And then I move to, I go to Leeds for a, like a month and I train and I come home. We don't see each other for three months. I'm like, Synchro for me is a headspace. And it's like, I just felt like it would have been way better, which I was right, 
that if we lived together and we just got in each other's heads and lives and lived and breathed it, not that we train sync for every day, but we were there every day. We saw the work that we were putting in. We pushed each other. Without him, I wouldn't be as good. And him, like without me, wouldn't be able to push himself maybe as hard. So it was a great learning curve for both of us. Yeah, and it was, well, back in 2014 when I actually first interviewed you, <laughs> you and Jack came to see you in Leeds. And I remember at the time you were both very much like, oh, it'd be great if we could get a medal in Rio. And it seemed like, you know, you were still fresh in your relationship when it was it was only going to get better. And I guess later that year, it kind of did, you know, gold at the Commonwealth, first gold, and it seemed like the partnership was really working. Yeah. I think there's a part of it where we were just like trying to be better than the last competition. And I think that was something that was what really played in our favour because I think when you get caught up in like outcome, I think then you put way too much pressure on the, the event or the big event like Olympics. And I think for us, our wins were almost in super casual and like, let's just beat our last competition and I really want to beat our PB and let's throw this new dive in that no one else has done in a synchro pair before. You know, I've kind of forgotten about that side to it, but that was ridiculous risk. Like we had an amazing list and we were competitive. We were medal hopes without that. And we were just like, uh, maybe we just do something new. Like we just put an extra twist. Jack already learned the dive. I didn't feel capable of doing the dive. AD taught me the dive and then I became sick at the dive. And then from there, it was one of my favorite dives to compete because it was like, okay, like in training, it's pretty good. But with the adrenaline, I know I can execute it. There was this great confidence in it. And it was almost like no one else is doing it because it's too difficult. And that almost gave us both power to be able to compete it even better to show how much of a risk it was it didn't even feel like a risk anymore it's a weird thing but there were there were a lot of risks there but like i said it was it paid off at glasgow 2014 to win to win that first goal that must have been even though the competition wasn't maybe as strong as at european level it still must have been nice to be on the top step of the podium yeah yeah that that was awesome and uh i think again it they all felt like stepping stones like it was oh we've done that now what's next and how can we beat that because the performances weren't amazing they were just good and consistent like there were still a lot of things that we needed to iron out and I think that just that just ran throughout our career was that was good but let's not like you know try and inflate our egos and you know stare at our medals in a cabinet like how do we how do we make moves on that like how what what three, five, two, one percents can we add to that and how? And that was like instrumental for the end success. And then you built on that in 2015, the following year, winning winning a, a global medal and the bronze medal at the World Championships. I mean, that I guess from the outside looking in, you were always in the mix for medals. It always seemed like you were one of the six duos who was going to be in the mix at a, a World or, or Olympics. And I guess that kind of solidified that you were actually probably top three. Um, how did you guys feel at, at that point? Didn't feel top three at that point. I was nervous for that one because it was the first Olympic qualifier. And I think in the back of my head, I I was thinking about it. But also, I was struggling so much with my list like during training that I was like, I just need to get through it. Like, I've not, I'm not, I don't like this pool. I don't like this board. I'm not like, I'm not vibing with, like the surroundings, like the walls were kind of all white uh, in Kazan and I wasn't seeing like, because you have to be very spatially aware, spatially aware, obviously. And like, I wasn't seeing like wall, water, entry. I was like, oh, entry, oh my God, like, where am I? And it just felt like that. And it really knocked my confidence. And then I think the prelim was really good apart from one dive. So I was like, okay, do that again, but then that dive, don't mess it up. And I think it was literally as simple as that. I I just tried to replicate what I did in the, in the morning and fix one thing rather than being like, 
I think, the headspace of like, oh, that was a fluke. Like, I didn't do any of my dives like that in training. Like, I'm going to mess them three up and maybe that other one will be good. Like, I tried to just approach it as just do exactly the same thing. And then just on that dive, you messed it up, just don't do it again. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then I saw the scoreboard and then it was like third. I was like, oh, there's going to be another diver like to come after me. And then like, they're going to then knock us down. So we'll probably be like fifth. Next diver goes, oh no, 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 we're good. And then the next one goes and it's like, oh, that's the last pair. And it's like, I can't remember, it's the like Italians or something. I don't know. And I was like, oh, they're not in contention. And I was like, we're literally third. That was mad. And I guess, did that then trigger thoughts for like the next year of like, you know, we're, we're world medalists now. There'll be a little bit of pressure and expectation that you guys can replicate that um, in Rio. Nah, I didn't think about that at all. Um, because we were we were putting this new dive in. And like I just kind of said before, this new dive, actually in a way, when I think about it in the way that you just put that, in terms of from like the press and from the expectation side, it was like putting that risk in almost gave an excuse like for failure. So it was like, if we fail, it's going to be because we, we bit off more than we can chew. And that also kind of helped my headspace. If it was just like our normal list and we're just going to do the list that we always do, um, then I would have, I think I would have approached it differently mentally. But I think because of this, this new dive, it was almost like, you know, it's either going to work or it's not. Um, and yeah, it worked. <laughs> Yeah, just obviously before you went to Rio, there was the European Champs, which oh, was yeah. back in the London Olympic Aquatic Centre. And that was, yeah, a gold medal. You know, nice to win a European title just before Olympics. That was that was like the pinnacle before the pinnacle. And that was uh, the reason being for that in our heads was we wanted to do one over on the Russians. Like the Russians were like, and they they just, they dominate. They're great. They're our biggest competition because China are normally ahead, so it's normally like a battle for second or third, and Russia are always there, and they're so annoying. Like they're just so good, and we were like, we need to knock their egos like before we hit the big games, and we did. And we used the we used triple out, and we trained it like in times where they didn't see, so that we would have more kind of like it would be more of a surprise when we did it. Um, that was a great feeling, like beating them with a home crowd and in the Olympic pool from London. That was that was great. Yeah, the perfect kind of goodbye to the to the before you go away away to Rio and then I guess on the way to Rio were you thinking like um you know another Olympics realistically what were your expectations from from those games just wanted a medal like I just wanted a medal hanging around my neck um I didn't care what color at all I think Jack will say the same or at least has said the same um and I think that was kind of the goal. It was like, let's go for that medal and hopefully we'll get it and not overthought. And I think we also, something else we did to approach it was not think about the outcome really. Like in interviews, we said, oh, we want, you know, we want to get a medal and we just want to have a good competition. But I think when we got to the Olympics, we very much, this is what I said about being a boy in the London Olympics and like this Rio Olympics, it was like, I'm a man now and I can sit in my room and, not be like an excited dog around the village and like, oh my God, there's that athlete, there's that athlete. Like, oh, let's go and do this or let's go and see how much pasta we can eat in the food hall. Do you know what I mean? Like, it was very much like, I know what I'm doing now and me and Jack can be in our own bubble and just take the Olympics out of the Olympics. And I suppose in terms of the actual competition, like your rivals, obviously China, you know, there were two time defending champions. And like you mentioned the Russians, they were in the mix. Do you ever think about them or do you just focus on your own dives and let them sort themselves out? Um, in terms of competition, I wouldn't ever have competed and looked at what other people were doing too closely. Um, you generally know 
what, like where you are on the scoreboard because I'll see my scores and I know like that's not good or that's good. And like I generally know what other people are capable of. So I think it's it's almost you can feel like when Russia's breathing down your neck or China's way out ahead or if you're in you know, like close, you know, proximity to China or whatever, you generally can always feel that throughout the competition. Um, but yeah, I did my own. Just we were me and Jack were in our element during Rio, and just approached everything with the most fierce positivity. And yeah, that we didn't think about anyone else. Even when like no disrespect at all, like I absolutely love uh, the USA boys. But when Mike Hickson got out of the water and they just absolutely nailed their four and a half, which is high degree of difficult three point eight. And it was all water splashing and beat that and finger to the crowd and all the yeah and then like looking at us and just took it with a pinch of salt like yeah cool Americans will be Americans at the end of the day can't stop it and then we went up there and just did our own thing um, we didn't let anything distract us even the color of the water what color was it in <laughs> by the time you competed was it that horrible green color yeah it was it's like resembled like Shrek's swamp well living quarters it was pretty gnarly um I had a pretty bad ear infection as well um I think because of the algae or whatever that was growing in the water um which wasn't pretty I also used my ears a lot I used to use my ears a lot I need to remember I'm actually retired um I used to use my ears a lot when I span around to know where I was in the air um and my left ear was not it was like I had a cup over my ear. So, and that was quite difficult. Um, but, you know, it, we got there. And obviously, yeah, this is your third defining moment is winning Olympic gold in Rio. And yeah, I mean, I guess from the outside looking in, we were expecting hopefully a medal. I think even gold from the media's point of view wasn't necessarily that realistic with how dominant China were. But as a diving is one of those spots where if you have a, a good day, have your best day, and somebody else doesn't, you can win the gold medal. And just talk us through it. That's kind of what happened, isn't it? Yeah, I'd say that's accurate. Um, there were other things that ran alongside it, which because me and Jack weren't necessarily paying that much attention, we didn't really, we didn't see it. But China during training was struggling and they were struggling because the pool was outside. Um, we prepared for that, and that was something that Team GB or, you know, Alexei Ivangulov, who was, uh, you know, like the MPD, National Performance Director of British Diving, said, we need to go out to Tallahassee for like two months and train outdoors. And we did that, and we trained in night, you know, at night time with the flood lit pool, and we didn't know where we were. It was horrible. Like, it was horrible trying to compete in the light, the wind, sun, rain, and then suddenly it goes, it's dusk, it goes dark, and then the floodlights are on, and it's blinding, and you're doing all these twists and turns, it was a nightmare, but because we did two months of solid prep, we got to that pool, and we were like, oh, this pool's so much better than the Tallahassee pool, so it was like a positive, Whereas I think a lot of people came to Rio and were like, we need to complain to the authorities. We can't train it when it's raining like this. And there's a thunderstorm. And like two days before the competition, our training slot that we got given, there was a thunderstorm and we all had to get out and we couldn't train. But instead of complaining about it, we just went like, yeah, cool. You know, we'll, we'll just we'll come back tomorrow. We'll train then. What was that actual competition like? Just from obviously you made the final confident of a medal and how did the six dives go yeah well like I just remember round one did my back dive and I'm really really notoriously bad like with my basic dives like I'm better at doing my hard dives and uh it's almost like I'm happy getting like nines on my in three and a half but getting nines on a basic I would be literally jumping around like it sounds ridiculous but I think I pulled I pulled through on my back dive and got eight, eight and a half. And Jack obviously got eight and a half, eight and a half, or maybe threw a nine in there because he's so good. And um, I was like, okay, like I just need to do that again on my reverse dive. And then I did it. And I was like, no way. I was almost like tapping myself on the back. And I think that was a really positive way to start. And then I did my double out, which was 
I kind of missed my hands a bit on the water and made a bit of a splash, but kind of got away with it. It was a bit lucky. And then I went forward to weigh with three and a half, nailed that. And then we went ahead to the triple out, which was the big one, which we smashed. And then it was like, oh, now we've just got front. And then that's our whole Olympic Games over. And like, I don't want this experience to end because it was just so good. And I remember I was listening to uh, to Dead Mouse. It's something that I always see. Dead Mouse is one of my biggest like musical inspirations. And I was listening to this like thing that actually isn't released, and it was like ripped off of YouTube, and it was really bad quality. But I can still remember it to this day. It just put me in this amazing state of mind, and I just felt so calm listening to it. And and I put my headphones on, and I was in this space. And then I took my headphones off, and then it was back to reality. And then I went up and the Americans did their thing, like I said, and there was a bit of a delay because the Mexicans were complaining about a camera that flashed or something like that. And we got up and we did it and it was all over and then done and it was like, oh, God, we won. It, it just was so quick. Like, there was... It, and no time to process. Like, uh, there was actually a moment where the camera panned over to me when I was trying to get changed. And, uh, yeah, it's the first time I've sworn live television. I won't repeat what I said, but... You know, where the are my trousers, basically. I, I just couldn't function. I didn't understand, like, what happened and how I needed to get dressed to go and receive a gold medal. Like, I was like, mm, nah, I'm going to wake up in a minute and then I'll have to do this. <laughs> it, must be, it must be hard to process because, you, you know, you, don't, you didn't... You know, we've won a gold medal at the Olympics and it's Britain's first ever gold in diving. I mean, the press would have been intense. I can imagine everyone was just going crazy in the team. What was that like? It, this is going to be a bit controversial, but it's like for like two weeks, it feels like it felt like I was constantly on drugs. Like it just felt out of body. Like I just felt like ridiculous euphoria um, of an intense amount that was like could, you couldn't number, you couldn't put it into words. It was just this feeling of like everything is done. It was almost like I, I'd actually compare it. You know, this is going to be really stupid, but it's quite accurate to how I felt. I'd almost compare it to, like, Lord of the Rings when Frodo throws the ring in the fire and it's like, it's done. It's done. And then it's like the darker bit after where it's like, wait, what the hell's next? Which I won't go too much into, but, like, that feeling is it's amazing. It's just like, it's completed. Like, it's done. And, and it happened. Like, what are the chances? Um, Because well, when I interviewed you back in 2014, both you and Jack said, like, Rio would be the best thing would be to be stood on the podium with my best mate, receiving a medal. That turned out to be a gold medal. You heard the national anthem. What was it like to actually get that, that medal around your neck? Yeah, amazing. And like I said, uh, th there's a picture of me, actually. Um, You can find on Google when I received the medal. And it's, it's a picture of me with the medal, and I'm, like, looking up. And that was me. I felt my parents, so my, my stepmom and my dad and my sister and my brother were there and Jack's family too. And then I felt like a presence from my mum and it was this all-encompassing moment of like, again, euphoria. And I had my best mate stood beside me and we, something we did together that no one can ever take away from us. And then obviously Jack himself went on to get a silver medal in the individual. I mean, how how do you rate him as a diver? You said he's probably one of the best in the world. I mean, how good is he? I know he's the best in the world. I know he's the best in the world at what he does. And I know that because he has a certain way of approaching every competition and this relentless thing inside of him that just wants more. And... It's never going to stop. Whatever he does, whether he leaves diving and, you know, he goes into plumbing, obviously that's ridiculous, he'll be the best plumber you've ever seen. Like, he's just that guy. Like, and he's so skillful at diving. And the moment that he applied himself as much as his skill level was, if you see what I mean, as soon as he started fully giving 100% to the professional side of the sport, he became unstoppable. There was no, there's no two ways about it. Like, he's stronger than everyone. 
He's more aware than everyone. He has his weak points, which he, like on his inward, he doesn't like it. And he's got a thing about, oh, I'm not as good at inward. He, he'll he still go nines on it when he needs to. Like, he's just the sort of guy that, and he has this confidence that's not arrogance. It's like just this self-belief that it's just in abundance. And as an athlete of that level, you need that if you're going to stay at the top. He's got it. I have no doubt in my mind that he'll, he will make waves in Tokyo. No doubt. Good. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> um, I guess for you, after after Rio, coming back to the UK must have been crazy, like you said, two weeks of, of euphoria. But then how was it after that? Was there a bit of a hangover going into the next year? Yeah, for about, mm, I'd say, until six months ago. Really? Um, yeah, I've had really bad depression. Um, one of the reasons I moved into doing music and took a new leap because I think kind of like I said before I lost I lost a lot of my I wouldn't say passion but I'd say like where I was getting my drive from and my kind of reason for living was so strong before and it was like like I said about the Frodo thing I know it's so dumb but it's so relatable to me and it's like that was done and then it was like I'm still diving but why like I don't really want to I don't feel I want to do another Olympics my back's kind of falling apart. My head's not in the game. I am I was just moaning about my back injury all the time. And it was just like something switched in my head. And it went from like anything can happen, like anything is possible to, oh, how am I going to get through this next competition cycle? And as soon as I realized that, I just said to Jack, I was like, mate, I've got to go. Like, I've got to do my thing. And I think Jack was a bit devastated, but I think a part of him was also extremely relieved because he could almost move on and start a new partnership and like be pushed or help push someone else because I was a bit of a lost cause at that time and I was only holding him back from his synchro event at that time. So moving into a new industry and starting from the bottom and earning my stripes was, it gave me this ridiculous purpose and instead of being in the gym or in the pool you know and then on the weekends doing cardio now I'm in here and I do ridiculous hours and I absolutely love it I'm constantly pushing myself and I have no struggle with being called out when I'm wrong and these are all things like that come with that athlete mentality and and just being that way inclined just proves to me that it helps in anything I'm going to do as long as I can almost relate it to them experiences that I've had I won't fail yeah that's good I guess you've you've, say you've learned a lot and taken it from the sport itself and did you think after Rio that did did your life change after Rio then do you think that you recognize a bit more a bit more celebrity or was it did you feel like you cashed in on that or is it something that kind of no. held you back a little bit i i didn't capitalize on on becoming olympic champion i didn't i did a couple of bits i did a really nice thing with bridgestone but that was more like i wanted to give something back and i felt that being involved in something that was rife in me at the time which was mental health struggle and helping other people achieve something and feel valued, et cetera, was at the core of what I was going through. I didn't, I didn't want to like sing and dance about it because I wasn't, I wasn't proud of it at that time. It felt like I just constantly wanted everyone to stop talking about it and for me to like somehow move on and, get out of this kind of pain and this headspace that I was in. Um, sorry to darken up the podcast a bit, but it's it's one of these things that I think it's interesting for people to know that how something that seems like would be so amazing can actually almost be like complete opposite. And it just obviously took me a lot of time. Well, yeah, well, a whole Olympic cycle, I guess, to kind of get yeah. to process it. Um, did you think that is psychologically why, like four years on, that kind of 
that's what you're, you've been trained to work in four year cycles and that maybe just mentally <laughs> checked out after four years you could be right i think for me the big one of the big parts was the lockdown and going into the lockdown, I started to realise how unhappy I was and that I was taking it out on a lot of people around me. Started doing therapy, started talking about stuff a lot more. Like, I obviously realised stuff, but I didn't really, you know, realise that I was being quite unkind to myself. And I was doing a lot of these hours, but I was almost frustrated at myself. And I was, I w- I was closed off. I wasn't really talking to people as much as I should have been. And... That lockdown period really helped me reach out. I didn't talk to Jack for two years, like I, not because I didn't like him, just because I didn't want to be associated with diving. Um, I also had gone through a breakup uh, that I was dating a girl within the program that fell apart, and there was a big kind of disconnect. One of my friends that were dating her it all got a little bit awkward for everybody. And I just needed to get out of there, reset and do something new and, you know, find that fire again. Yeah, because obviously after after Rio, you, um, well, you went to the World Champs, came fourth in 2017 and then won, won gold at the Gold Coast at the Commonwealth Games and silver at the Euro. So you were so winning medals, but then, then you decided to have a year off. Was that around that time you started to kind of feel a bit like, I can't do this anymore? Yeah, I mean... The purpose, honestly, behind the year off was I can't do this anymore, but I'm scared that I might change my mind. <laughs> so I'll say I'll have a year off and I'll I'll definitely take some of the funding. Um, not that not in a disrespectful way, but in a way of that to me was transition money. And this is something else I definitely want to try and help other athletes with in the future is as soon as you're out of the picture, no one cares. And it's like, okay, you know, you're not doing this anymore. And I know so many people that it's like, oh, yeah, so as of uh, Monday, we won't be paying you. And it's like, hang on a minute, this has been my whole life. You told me not to study, you know, and you told me to take this really seriously. And I did. And now I have nothing. So um, it leads on to a much different conversation. But um, I just thought I'd mention that. Um, But, yeah, for me... It was it was a transition phase and I either was going to take four months off and go, what am I doing? Let's get back. It didn't happen. And I, I knew I needed to get out of there. Um, you just mentioned there, obviously, about how there's not that kind of duty of care from the federations and places, things like that. After Rio, I mean, your coach got kind of what happened there? What happened with AD? Because he was then coach of Australian team. And was were they did they not treat him very well? What kind of happened? Well, now I'm out of the loop. I can tell you exactly what happened. Um, without any problem, you know, I'm not tied to anyone. Uh, at the time it was difficult to talk about and there were a lot of sensitive subjects and it wasn't allowed to really be put a light on. We tried and we got squashed quite quickly with that. (laughs) It's expected. Um, I think what happened was AD changed his, like he made history with us and he was very much the person that made that happen. We used to have weekly meetings where he'd like make us call each other out and rate each other out of 10. It was horrible. Like we did all these things for these, what I was saying about these one, two, three, four, five percents. He spear, like he was the, the, the forefront of that and he made that happen. And they came back and said, well done, we'll give you an extra five grand a year. And he was like, it's not going to cut it. And it shouldn't be about money at the end of the day, but. I was insulted and it wasn't even about me. Then I think America, uh, like the Team USA came on board and they were throwing some ridiculous figures out to him for to actually be the national performance director of USA Diving and it was something ridiculous like half a mil a year. Um, so he was like, uh, 35 grand to stay in Leeds or, you know... And then it was Australia reached out and said, like, look, we know that you've you've now got got twins. We want to put you up here and you can be, you know, really high up in the program, have your own athletes. And AD was really interested in uh, a couple of divers over there. And um, he put that on the table to the UK and he said, look, I've got this offer and I'm considering it. 
And uh, they didn't act. They just went, yeah, he won't leave Chris and Jack. He won't leave Leeds. He won't leave his programme. And good on him, he did, because he absolutely deserves to, to live a life of luxury, which I assume he's living now. You know, I talk to him every now and again. He's got, he's got a lot of cash and he deserves that. And he's got a lovely environment to raise his kids in. Australia's an amazing country, amazing people around him. Fair play to him. And do you think that actually had an impact on, on your career as well? Did that make another reason for that kind of Olympic hangover and, and changes and it not, not being quite as much fun? Possibly. I think had AD stayed, I think he would have encouraged me to leave. Yeah. Because he would have been trying to push me and I would have probably been struggling to keep up. And I think had that happened, I may have left quicker. But that didn't happen, you know. It's impossible to say. I think AD needed some time too, like to come down off of it all. And it's very emotional for everybody. But Adam did a great job stepping in as, as our coach. And um, that was a new learning process. And that almost felt like I could give something back as well. It was the, one of the positive things in staying in Leeds and keeping diving was passing a bit of knowledge on from my competition experience to a coach who never ever coached anyone to kind of a world level before even like he'd done national level but uh yeah like not even international so like that was a big a big step for him and I felt grateful that I could pass on and kind of boot him up in a way but I suppose in in 2017 there was still something exciting which was your your fourth defining moment which was being awarded an MBE how does that happen how do you find out do you do you get a letter how does it work yeah you get a letter um ridiculous <laughs> I just... were you expecting it how, how you know did you get the letter no. and think hang on what, what's this <laughs> i didn't expect it uh i didn't expect it at all and i obviously knew what an mbe was i knew what I, you know i know what it all is but just the thought i don't know i have an image in my head which is probably completely warped of the sort of character that gets something like that and it's not me so when it came through in the post, I was like, I don't even like wearing suits. Like, what? how am I even going to... I don't know. It was just in my head. It was just really weird and, like, amazing. Like, to be acknowledged for what we'd done. <laughs> I don't know, man. It was just mental. We were just like, what the hell? Like, and now, to be fair, the best part about having an MBE, this obviously a bit of a joke but it's quite funny is if I ever get a really bad email from someone and I need something doing I can sign off Chris Mears MBE <laughs> and normally it gets done <laughs> yeah the, the power of the MBE um, yeah who, who did you get it from what, what day was that when you got it uh, I, guess... I got it from Prince Charles yeah god knows what day I can't remember now um but yeah me and Jack stayed in this <clears throat> awesome hotel um, I can't remember what it's called now, but it's right next to Buckingham Palace. Uh, we stayed in this amazing hotel. It was like, I've looked afterwards, it's like a grand a night. It's ridiculous. Um, and uh, yeah, stayed in this really luxurious hotel and ate so much food and drunk loads of tea and, you know, did all that. Got our MBE and it was an amazing day and uh, I could have three people there. So I had my uh, mum, dad and my sister came along. Um, it was incredible. It was beautiful. Yeah. And I guess, did Prince Charles say anything to you? He did. He did indeed. He, uh, God knows if he had an earpiece in or I, I think it would be very difficult to keep up with, uh, with all of them people and all of them stories. I know I definitely couldn't do that. But um he said something along the lines of, uh, you know, I heard the water was green when you competed. And I was like, it, yes, it was. It was very green. Um, and he said, you, you know, you're an absolute honour to this country and what you did will echo throughout the books of history. And I said, thanks. And then that was it. <laughs> um, then, uh, yeah, I guess 2018, like we've said, it, you know, Commonwealth gold, uh, European silver, but then you knew that that was kind of going to be the, the end. But you still obviously performed well. Were you, how did you find that year? Um, full of anxiety, full of thinking I had something 
wrong with me, like a heart problem or something physical going on. Did numbers of like so like countless tests and uh, realized it was literally just anxiety. And, you know, I'd get heart palpitations and uncomfortable feelings. Like when we did, we did a World Series event in maybe Guangzhou or something like that in China. And um, I couldn't really breathe during my event. Heart rate was really going and got to the last round and I normally count. I'd say ready, one, two, three, go. And I actually couldn't say go. It was because I had no breath there. And Jack had to just guess <laughs> that we were going. <laughs> And uh, we still smashed it and we got second, which is fantastic. But as soon as the dive finished, I got up off the poolside and laid on the floor and put my hand up and was like, someone help me, I can't breathe. And then, yeah, it's just anxiety. And I just had no idea what was going on. But it was to, an, to a, such an extreme level. I just, yeah, it was really, really uh, difficult. Um, but I got through it. And then you said, you obviously, you announced you were taking a year off, but you kind of had retired and then you did announce your retirement. Was that, how did you feel about that? Did you feel like it was the end of a chapter or were you just relieved it was over? Yeah, I think I wasn't at this point, I wasn't bothered about um, telling the world, telling anybody like my story. I was like, I'm comfortable with myself and like, I, I, I know this is the right decision. Like, I didn't so much deem it necessary as such to go like hey everyone I've retired just in case you care like I think it was almost a, a thing of like I'm going to do an announcement because almost because of my achievements and you know put a line under the sand and say this is what happened and this was fantastic and almost an opportunity to thank a lot of people as well um for what they did for me and um, rather than a personal thing of like you know trying to gloat almost because I find not that you're gloating when you're retiring but I just there's something about the whole social media thing that bugs me sometimes and I think it's really nice to share good things on um and that was kind of what I felt like that was for it was for thanking people like Malcolm Green who you know trained me when I was at Reading and I was a little boy and Lindsay Fraser for, you know, seeing so much potential in me, my parents, my grandparents for taking me to training and all of these things, you know, that all of the people that help you get to where you, you got. But obviously you've mentioned that like when you do leave like the network around you kind of stops and you kind of left out there on your own. That's something that I think a lot of sports people do struggle with and is that something that needs to be kind of looked at a little bit more? Yeah, I'd I'd say potentially. Um potentially, yes. I had a good experience generally because I still had access to talk to the diving psychologist if I wanted to. And as I say, they were still paying me for a period of time, um, which was because of the medal. Like they were questioning, like people above were questioning, like, why are we doing this? Um, you know, why, why are we going to give him money when we could rightly so give it to somebody else lower down and help them come up? But um, I think it. I think it asks a bigger question, and that is almost about morals and like when some of my friends, like Freddie, you know, retired, and and Jack Haslam, some of my best mates, and there's not much help there, and it's very much like you know, goodbye, you know, and that's it. And I think that's not just in diving at all. I think that's generally within sport, and I think. There needs to be more thought going along whilst you're at an elite level, <clears throat> almost pushing you to be great at your training, but also look outside of what you're doing in your sport and learn other skills or find a new interest. Because I'd hate, I, I know that they will, that like some of them, but I hate to think about how some of my friends will feel when they leave. And that, that really cuts me quite deep because I know that if they thought about it a bit now then when they get to that point it would be easier. But I guess you've always kind of had your music going on is that something that's been kind of a blessing in a way that you've had something else to focus on throughout those those tough years? Yeah and that was something that I think a lot of people were very confused about it and were like why is he doing that because music is as obviously a very tough industry to crack. Um but it was the only other thing I was passionate about. 
like I'm not I'm, like I said I don't do things by halves and if I wasn't diving then I was in my room on a weekend locking myself in my room uh making music and just vibing and having fun and you know that was that was almost my escapism from being an athlete and when we were away on tour um I say on tour like you know obviously doing the rounds competitions and stuff I was in the hotel making music and my cousin is an extremely decorated songwriter and he's written songs for artists like Youngblood, James Arthur. Uh, yeah, so he's uh, he's very established in that kind of world and I always saw something in us and that we could work together um, and it was something that I worked towards my entire diving career really. And now that you've said the last year has been pretty fruitful and, and just, well, going into your fifth defining moment is that, you know, a song that you, you worked on with Felix Yarn has had 40 million streams on, on Spotify. Is that, that's, I mean, pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it's mental. Um, I met a guy called Danny Horsfield and he is an A&R at Warner Chapel. Um, and then he ended up, signing me he would have signed me and my cousin but unfortunately my cousin was uh, stuck in another deal um so he signed me for the publishing side of music which is making music for other artists and producing for other artists and he saw something in me and I think he saw my my uh kind of headspace and the way that I work and I give everything my all and I think he saw a lot of potential especially in the dance side of things he's got a lot of amazing connections and he just threw it on my lap like yeah, we've been working together. He's now managing Bloodline, which is me and my cousin, Robbie. And he just said, "Do you, have you heard of Felix Jan? And I was like, yep, the the guy that's like dominating Germany in the dance industry. And he was like, yeah, um, he's got four songs that he's done in writing sessions and he needs production. Uh, do you want to give it a crack? And I said, send me the files now. <laughs> And uh, this was in the middle of a lockdown and he sent me the files and then he said, Felix wants to FaceTime you and get to know you because he likes to get to know his producers. And Felix is going through a pretty rough time mentally and we really connected over it and we figured out a way of putting that into the music. So we chose this song, No Therapy, uh, which is kind of about, you know, it's title's kind of in the lyrics it's being feeling so good and you don't need anyone you don't need therapy you don't need this or that and that was a song that he'd written and yeah I basically took it and I reproduced it and uh wrote a new hook for him and that was that and then suddenly he was like I'm going with it and there I think there are there was a moment when there was 20 other producers working on the song and that was from people that have produced for David Guetta people that have produced for massive artists like Alan Walker a global artist and I think I approached it in a similar way to everything else where it was just kind of like well I'm just going to do it until it's hopefully really good and then if it's not good enough then I can at least delete the top line and put write another song over it you know <laughs> so I think there was always a positive in there and um, now I work with Felix almost on a weekly monthly basis and we're always looking at ways to kind of expand on on what he's trying to do. And yeah, he's got like 20 million monthly listeners, which is ridiculous. Um, so 40 million streams in, in a couple months, I mean, like three or four months is it's really good. It's really good going. Um, and it's still growing. It's still getting like 200,000 plays a day. Uh, so yeah, it's still, still growing really strong. And um yeah fingers crossed for that uh, gold plaque at some point I think it's quite close to it already so uh, that would it's a dream come true I, I guess you know you can compare it to medals you know I guess it's my first medal yeah so you can have your Olympic gold next to your gold disc <laughs> <laughs> yeah one day yeah that would be nice but does this, does this feel like the start of a new journey for you then I know you've been working on music for years but now it's starting to gain some traction and, and this year has been a really good year for you It's it seems like it's really taking off yeah for sure um it feels like it's at a point now and now that we've got music out we've got all of our branding and we've put a lot of thought into how we want to kind of tell our story um within the music as well as outside of it on kind of social media and stuff 
um it definitely feels like it's our time to kind of get our music out there to people and we've had a song out already on the bloodline that's got over a million streams already and it just came out a month ago which is really good we have a song coming up with a big artist um probably shouldn't mention it yet um two big artists actually um one vocaling and one together with the production so that's super exciting that should be coming in march or april um and i am beyond excited to share that and then we've got another collaboration later on in the year as well as our three singles from our main project that looks like we're signing with rca i think it's just going to long form now and that's going through germany um so yeah uh, again very surreal surreal stuff and some of the conversations we're having about these uh, collaborations seem like a dream um, and I'll believe them when they come out let's just say that <laughs> hey Olympic gold happened so you never know <laughs> yeah yeah it's st- I think same with how you approach that kind of thing and just with with a lot of positivity and just keep working really hard and keep your head down and enjoy what you're doing and and that you should end up somewhere in the right place so yeah, after after kind of a rough few years, then how how are you feeling at the moment, and what does the the future look like for Chris Mears? Um, I'm feeling the best I've ever felt in my life, and I can finally say that with a smile on my face. Um, I've got so many amazing people around me. Uh, I mentioned Danny, obviously my cousin Robbie, got my amazing girlfriend Katie, and uh, during lockdown we got a little bit bored, so we bought a bunny, uh, and he's called Stormy, and he's hilarious. Uh, I've I'm back obviously moved back home. I'm very close to my parents now, and um, because I was kind of silent when I was living up there in Leeds, reconnected with a lot of family and uh, got a lot of amazing friends within the music industry. And I think that is one of the reasons why everything is now becoming very successful. Is almost because I've landed in the right place and I've put in so much hard work to get to this kind of skill level. Yeah, it's almost like it doesn't matter too much about the result now. I'm making good enough money. I'm very excited about projects I'm working on. And yeah, the future looks bright. Exciting. Um, so just looking back on those the five moments that you've mentioned, which were um, losing your mother when you were young, uh, having the life-threatening kind of illness uh, when you were 15, uh, winning the Olympics in Rio, that first gold medal for Great Britain um, in diving, and the MBE. And the uh, fifth one was the the streams you just mentioned with Felix. If you had to pick one of those five, that would be the one that you're kind of most proud of. Which one would that be? Um, I've got to go for the Felix thing. Yeah. And I'm going to go with the Felix thing because it's the start of something new and it's more relevant to where I am now. A lot of the other things very much feel like they're left in the past and they make up who I am. But I think... The thing with Felix kind of shows my potential as a producer and where I'm going in my career now. And it feels like a stepping stone to some other bigger jobs and to some other bigger productions for bigger artists. So, yeah, let's see. Um, Obviously, during like a sports career, there's highs and lows. And obviously, we've discussed quite a lot of them. What have you learned from those? and, And how do you think you can implement them in your life at the moment? I think the biggest thing is, and I think this will resonate with a lot of people, is like the bad things always outweigh the good things. So like you always remember that dive that went wrong and then trying to not do that again is like so difficult. And also just getting over some of the bad performances is so memorable. Like you just always remember them. But whereas you kind of forget the good ones, they kind of slip away from you and it's like, oh yeah, that went right that time. But you know, remember this time when it went really badly. And I think applying that, to life is very good and I think that just kind of comes from a headspace thing of like there are days where we're sat in the studio and we're writing a song at the moment over zoom which is uh, sometimes like a bit like you want to pull your hair out but um yeah some days are bad some days are amazing some days are good and it's just kind of taking everything with a pinch of salt and once that day's done you're onto a new day you're onto a new song and a new vibe and you just kind of work in that way and I think you can only then look back at your work like I did recently. I look back at kind of three years ago, the kind of stuff I was writing and producing and just look at the levels going up. And that's what I used to do in diving as well. I used to look back on my old technique and go like, yeah, that was not very good. And now it's better. Um, so, yeah, it's all about improving and, and just getting into a good headspace. 
And is there anything that you would have done differently in your career? Like you mentioned dives that went wrong. Would you, you know, what would you, anything you would, would have changed? Mm, good question. No, I don't think in the diving stuff, I think, I think I approached that really well. Um, the only thing I maybe would have done was to try and slap myself out of the uh, kind of poor me uh, vibe that I had going on and try and pick myself up a little bit quicker and go, come on, you're better than this. Like, either do it or get yourself out of it. That's probably the only thing I'd change, but, you know, that also led to where I am now, so I'm not angry at it. And what would you say to that um, that young Chris Mears who was going to his first diving lesson and, and trying it for the first time? What Would you give him any advice? Um, again, it might alter the outcome, so probably not. I'd probably just say, yeah, just enjoy it. Just, just you know, just enjoy it. I think that's first and foremost. Okay, well, thanks for that. I mean, where can we find you now? What, where can we find all your music and where can we find you on social media? Yeah, well, on Spotify, we are Bloodline. And we will soon to be, we're trying to get it changed on Spotify at the moment in all capitals. But um, you'll be able to find us, in, uh, us on Instagram as it's underscore bloodline. Um, yeah, look out for the black and orange. That's kind of a trademark to our, uh, yeah, to, to our branding. Um, yeah, watch this space and hope you enjoy the music. Well, Chris, thank you for being a guest on uh, My Defining Moments. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Well, that was a really interesting chat with Chris Mears. I didn't quite appreciate how bad it got after the Olympics for him uh, with his mental health there, but it's really good to hear that he's in a great place now and his music career is really building momentum, so really wishing him all the best of luck. Thanks again for listening to the My Defining Moments podcast. I really do appreciate all the comments and feedback I've had, so feel free to rate or review the podcast. It's available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, Amazon, you name it, (laughs) I'm on it. Yeah, and if you've got any feedback or suggestions for guests on the show, you can contact me on social media at Chris Brownspot. So thanks again for listening, and I'll be back again soon.